Have you ever wondered if HIV can be cured and what the future of HIV research holds? We will be joined by a leading expert. Welcome to 18 Minutes With, production of Scientific American Custom Media in collaboration with our sponsors. I am Jeremy Abbott, VP and publisher of Scientific American. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Kimberly Smith, the head of research and development at Beave Healthcare. Dr. Smith, how are you? And thank you for joining. Hi, Jeremy. I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Let's just dig right in. HIV is still a stigmatized condition. And I know that your trajectory into medicine has been both about the science, but also about the societal impact. You know, you've said you've got a history to quote Congressman John Lewis. Uh, you've got a history of making good trouble. And, and, and you know, that was... Um, that's kind of why you focused your medical career on infectious disease and the HIV. Can you explain the connection? Well, you know, when I was um, in college and uh, ultimately in medical school, you know, was, was the, the early days of the HIV epidemic. And um, it was on the screen all the time. But what you were seeing was, you know, protests. I mean, you saw people demanding access to uh, research. You, you saw people demanding that, that there be attention towards this, you know, this, this horrible disease that was really killing people at uh, alarming uh, numbers. And, and it wasn't really being discussed in, in, in it, you know, took a long time for the president to ever, you know, say anything about HIV at the, at the time. And, 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 you know, I was grabbed by that because, you know, you just felt like this is this new disease that came out of nowhere and people are dying and folks aren't paying attention. And it was, it was impacting folks who were marginalized. Um, you know, what we saw mostly on television was um, the men who had sex with men. But what we also knew was that there was a large number of uh, injection drug users that were also impacted in those early days and were dying again at alarming rates of, uh, you know, young at young ages. And so, I was grabbed by it for the, you know, social impact, uh, just, you know, the worst, the folks who need uh, the most getting access to the least. And that's, uh, that was, that was a problem for me, um, in the way I look at the world. And, and then the disease itself, um, fascinating in, in, from a medical standpoint. And you, you worked at a public hospital, Cook County Hospital, outside of Chicago. You ran clinical trials there. And you know, how did that approach, how did that kind of shape your approach to tackling HIV? And, and, and how have you brought that to, to Vive uh, Healthcare? So I had a unique experience. I worked at Rush University Hospital and Cook County Hospital, actually both right in the center of Chicago. So really right in, uh, right in, right, not too far from downtown Chicago. And, you know, so I, I got to see um, a lot of the range of, of experiences with HIV. So Cook County Hospital, you saw uh, mostly uh, individuals who, you know, didn't have private insurance, didn't have access to healthcare often diagnosed very late, primarily individuals who were, uh, you know, who were poor, didn't have a lot of research resources, and mostly, um, you know, black and brown individuals in, in, you know, Cook County Hospital, now known as Stroger Hospital. At Rush, uh, which was a, a private institution, you saw more of a mix of individuals who had private insurance, and that's where you saw a range of, you know, uh, white individuals with, uh, who are men who have sex with men or uh, people who uh, contracted it from blood transfusions and lots of other ways. And so, you know, I saw the range of people, you know, sort of the haves and the have nots when it comes to sort of uh, healthcare in general. Yeah, uh, we, we passed a kind of an anniversary last year, 40 years since the first uh, person infected with HIV and AIDS and no, We've obviously, there's been so much progress, so much scientific innovation. We really have transformed HIV from a likely death sentence to a chronic disease. Yet a cure has remained so elusive. Why is that? 
Well, you're, you're right that there has been, you know, a transformation of HIV from uh, a disease that was pretty much uniformly fatal um, to now a disease that can be controlled with um, daily medicines, taking as little as one pill a day, and and now actually with with long-acting uh, treatments where you can dose uh, as little as as once every couple of months. Uh, so. And people live normal lifespans uh, with this treatment. So it is absolutely transformed. That said, though, even when you're on treatment, you continue to have HIV. And as soon as you stop taking medicines, basically, you know, the virus comes back and, you know, the manifestations of HIV will it, return. And so it is a, a disease that persists in the body despite treatment. Why is that? Well, so HIV integrates itself into the, the host DNA. So it, it hides itself in the, in the cells and those cells go dormant uh, in, in the body. And so they're invisible to the immune system. And so while you're on treatment, they're basically just sitting there not doing anything. Um, but if you go off treatment, those cells basically sort of wake up and start to produce virus again. And you, you know, again, it's almost like you never had treatment. And so um, why is it difficult to cure? Well, because of that dormancy, it's quite difficult to actually get that, get the body to do it on its own, the immune system to do it on its own. And so we have to sort of find a way to wake up that latent virus and, and get it to show itself to the immune system and then, you know, boost up the immune system to be able to clear it. That's, that's basically our strategy for trying to get out of cure. That's a great segue. I just want to quickly talk about your scientific approach, and then we're going to get to some questions from the viewing audience. You know, in, instead of trying to kill off this elusive HIV-infected cell, you know, your strategy is to awaken it, right? The latent or sleeping HIV in the cells, then try to eliminate it. And I think you refer to it as induce and reduce. So. Why activate the virus if you're trying to protect people from it? And how well is this approach working? Well, so I, I think it's important to understand that um, what, what HIV treatment does is keeps the virus from making copies of itself. It blocks the virus from being able to do that. And so when you, when you do that, the immune system, you know, rebuilds itself and people uh, actually can, can live pretty normal, healthy lives. However, they are not cured of HIV. They still have it. And as soon as they stop taking those medicines, it will break out and start to damage the immune system again. And so the, the reason why you need to sort of wake up, wake up that sort of latent or dormant virus is, that, is, is to get it to be visible so that we can, we can clear it. As long as it's laying latent and hiding from the immune system and the drugs aren't able to get at it, then, you know, you will continue to have uh, HIV disease. And so that's, so what we want to do is get to a cure. And, and, you know, it's a, I think one of the things that people sometimes say, well, if you have treatment and people, as long as people can do well on treatment, then, you know, why bother with the cure? Well, uh, the reason for that is one, um, it is still a very stigmatized disease, as we've, as we've talked about. But it's also that if you don't have to be on medicines for, you know, your entire lifespan, you would prefer to not do that. I mean, any medicines have side effects, and even though we've made major progress. Folks would certainly like to be without having to take a medicine to keep, uh, to keep the virus uh, suppressed. One of the questions that came in online is, you know, if you are waking up, stimulating this latent virus, does that put patients at risk at all? Well, so that's a really great question. And uh, what, you know, what we're looking to do is find a way to get that balance right, where we can, you know, stimulate those cells to show the fact that they're infected with HIV and get the immune system to sort of kill off those infected cells without having it cause significant toxicity to the person. But that is a delicate balance and, you know, not, not easy to do. I mean, that's part of why we haven't gotten to a cure thus far is that, you know, turning on parts of the immune system can cause some toxicities. So trying to get that balance right is exactly what, we, uh, what we're looking to do. Another question coming in about this maybe wonderful world, if we could cure it, you know, would we eliminate this forever? Would it be the kind of virus we would have to still live with? you know, connecting it to obviously the epic we've just all been through, 
What are your thoughts on what a world might look like if we had a cure? What would what would you know, our relationship with this virus be globally? Well, you know, I think if when we get to a cure, or we want to get to a cure that's available uh, for the world. So not just a cure for, you know, people in, you know, rich developed countries, but a cure that's available and scalable to everyone. And so that's that's a really important priority when we start talking about a cure. So, you know, what would a world look like? Well, I mean, you know, there's still um, millions of individuals in the world today that don't have access to treatment. And so if we you know, if we were going to get a cure, we need to get it to all of those people as well. And, you know, first step might be getting actually treatment to the rest of the, that 10 million or so individuals that aren't, on, that aren't able to access treatment. But what would it look like? Well, I think it would be a, a real change for uh, particularly places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a really huge numbers of people who are living with HIV disease and, and, and still unfortunately dying with HIV disease. And so it would make a big difference in the overall lifespans of people around the world. Now, I've heard you speak before, and I know Vive has made a commitment to make drugs for HIV available to everyone who needs them, and regardless of whether it's gonna maximize profits. What would happen to healthcare if more companies thought that way? Um, it's a you know gauntlet I think you've thrown down to the industry. Well, I mean, we, we like to think of ourselves as being different and that, you know, as the only company that's 100 percent focused on HIV, we do feel an absolute commitment to uh, leaving no person living with HIV behind. And so that means making our medicines available. And, you know, so there are 22 million people around the world that are taking advantage of one of our medicines to keep their virus under control. And so, you know, people that are in some of the poorest countries in the world are receiving the same medicine as people in Chicago, New York, or Los Angeles. And so we're, we're very proud of that, that impact. And so what would it look like if the rest of, if other pharmaceutical companies made that same commitment? Well, some do uh, make a commitment to making their medicines available widely in, in resource limited settings. But, you know, not all do. And if everybody, I think, tried as hard as we do to, uh, to make sure that their medicines became available, I think that that would be a very positive thing for uh, healthcare globally. Great. Uh, here's a great question from, from someone. And I know, you know, viruses are on people's minds, obviously, in so many ways. So a little bit of a scientific question. How unique is HIV versus, you know, other retroviruses? You know, would this approach apply to other diseases? How, how universal might, might this be? Well, when you think about uh, many viruses, the, the, the immune system actually contains them. So probably let's, let's use maybe the example of the virus that causes chickenpox, also being the virus that causes shingles, right? So, so when people have chickenpox as a child, they don't go on treatment. They basically eventually get better and the immune system contains the chickenpox, but it doesn't cure it, it actually remains dormant in, in the body, and, and it can come out when your immune system becomes weaker as an adult as shingles. And so that, that's one example of, a, of, of sort of a virus that the immune system can contain. HIV, on the other hand, because it actually um, really damages the immune system, uh, so, you know, the way that HIV functions is that it, it enters CD4 cells, it uses the machi machinery of the CD4 cell to make copies of itself, and then it goes on and destroys uh, those, those CD4 cells. That just breaks down the immune system and people become vulnerable to all sorts of infections. And so HIV attacks essentially the immune system that would be what would destroy it, um, basically. Whereas other viruses, like I mentioned, um, the, the, the varicella, varicella virus that causes chickenpox, it doesn't attack the immune system. And so, you know, it basically, the immune system gets it under control. So. You know, HIV is very unique in that way. Uh, basically, essentially, you're, you're attacking the army that would, would, take, would take you out before it, that army has a chance to do it. Here's a question about this post-pandemic world. Have, have research priorities in, in, in industry and perhaps even, you know, in, in, in academia changed because of what the world went through? The approach to discovery, perhaps even the ecosystem of innovation, how has that impacted, you, do you think, the, the general 
uh, world of discovery, research and discovery, and particularly in what you do day to day? Well, I think that in general, the world was, I think, impressed by the rapidity um, which you know, industry came up with vaccine for um, for coronavirus, um, so for COVID nineteen, and and part of that success was because of the work that had been done in trying to develop vaccines for other diseases like HIV. So some of the platforms that had been used to develop other viruses were quickly shifted to be able to focus on on. Uh, the COVID-19 virus, and, and that's why we were able to get a vaccine so quickly. So this was really the first time the mRNA platform technology was successful in developing a vaccine. And so that is has become sort of a, a, a new model that folks will use to try to, to generate vaccines against other viruses. And so I do think that that's a major, uh, a major movement that will happen as a result of this pandemic. Great. Here's another science question. Uh, you know, what is the biggest challenge ahead for your approach? What is technically, scientifically, the biggest obstacle you need to overcome in the future? Yeah, I think the biggest obstacle is that that dormant or latent virus, or what we call the HIV reservoir. So, you know, again, people can be on treatment for decades, and that reservoir is not changing. So you've got uh, this millions of cells that are infected with HIV that are sitting there dormant. That is the biggest barrier. And so our ability to basically try to knock down that reservoir and actually completely get rid of it is is re really the biggest barrier and so why why do we why is that tough it's exactly the reason that someone else asked the question you know is there is there risk or are, are there side effects to trying to get rid of that that latent virus or try to wake up that latent virus that's the tough thing is yeah getting at that is the toughest part finding a way to turn on those cells so that they show the fact that they're infected with hiv and, and allow the immune system to come after them in some way, maybe boost the immune system so that it goes after those cells. That's the that's the barrier. Here's a here's a service journalism question. Can someone who is on retroviral drugs get the vaccine? Should they be concerned with any anything uh, around vaccines? So someone who's living with HIV and has um, has is on medicine and has an undetectable viral load and a strong immune system certainly can uh, take vaccines and is highly uh, recommended to take vaccines like the flu vaccine every year and uh, pneumonia vaccine and the coronavirus vaccine certainly is uh, is a, is recommended for individuals who are living with HIV. That's that's great to know. We are we are at our 18 minutes and I just wanted. To See if you want to add anything around the future of HIV research that you want to tell the viewing audience. Well, you know, I uh, what I what I think is important for the viewing audience to understand is that HIV is still a, a real significant um, area of research. It's still impacting some 37 million people around the world, and so it still should be high on our priority list. You know, it's not been at the top of the news like. Some you know a pandemic can move move anything off of the top of the news, right? We are not talking about HIV, but there's still roughly 37,000 new infections that happen every year in the United States. We have now ways to prevent HIV with with something called PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. We have very good treatments, and so the message that I always want people to walk away with is that you know if you haven't been tested for HIV, it's important to be tested so that you can access treatment. And if you may, you think you may be vulnerable to HIV, then you know there are options out there to prevent HIV if you don't, if you're not currently infected. And so I like to remind folks that this is still something that is very, you know, prevalent in our environment, and we want people to go and get tested and know their status. That's a great message. Thank you so much for the time, Dr. Smith. Your personal sense of purpose does a lot of good within the industry that you're in. And we thank you for that service. And we thank you here from Scientific American Custom Media for spending some time with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Have a good day. Wonderful, thanks so much.